darkness. They have been traumatized. They have been abused. Children being sold in an underground world. How a new movie is fighting the crime here in the Valley. Honoring a legend. The man who put UNLV on the map gets the star treatment. We give you the very first look at Jerry Tarkanian's new statue. Tears of joy, the video that's being shown everywhere, what one mom did that made this baby start crying. Now, Nevada's first choice for news. This is 8 News Now at 4. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. The numbers are staggering. As many as 27 million people worldwide are victims of human trafficking, and it's a growing problem here in Las Vegas. The Southern Nevada Human Trafficking Task Force held an event in partnership with MGM Resorts International to raise awareness about this issue, and 8 News Now reporter Diane Tuazon was at the event and has more on what uh, message they're trying to get across. You know, human trafficking is a huge business generating up to $32 billion a year, and a lot of these recruitments happen right here in our valley. The conference is to inform the community that more needs to be done to try and stop it. New Bilber were unveiled yesterday to inform the community about the problem and today was a different approach. The Southern Nevada Human Trafficking Task Force held a day-long conference to address everything from resources for those who need help to ways to avoid becoming a victim. They say many victims who get drawn into the human trafficking industry are recruited at a young age, some as young as 13 years old. That's why raising public awareness is key. We do have young victims out there that we want to identify and so that we can provide them the services as well as prosecute those who are guilty of doing this. Victims were there and shared their personal experience in hopes to reach out to others who need the help. There's also a special documentary associated with the campaign to set the hit the airwaves in January. Now coming up at 5, hear how they hope to reach out to the younger crowd about raising awareness on human trafficking. Diane, thank you. The man accused of opening fire inside a strip nightclub this month, killing a man and injuring two others, says he doesn't remember that night. Benjamin Frazier was in court this morning for the first time. He'd been in a coma since the shooting. The 41-year-old's lawyer says his client is shocked and saddened by what happened at Bally's, but doesn't remember it. Police say Frazier shot three people at Dre's after an argument about a $30 cover charge. The death penalty may still be an option. The death penalty is not an option, though, in the case of a young Adrian Navarro Canales. He's accused of killing his mother and younger brother in Henderson. That's because Canales is only 16 years old. He appeared in court today. He's expected to plead not guilty in a couple of weeks. He was arrested in September on the Strip, five days after his family members' bodies were found in the home they shared. Clark County's district attorney wants to stay on the job. Today, he announced his candidacy for re-election in 2015. Wolfson was appointed by the Clark County Commission 19 months ago when his predecessor, David Rogers, stepped down. A slew of politicians and even celebrities came out to show their support. Wolfson says there is still a lot of work to be done. In the last 20 months, the district attorney's office has come a long way. We are more transparent, more open in the way we do business, and also mindful of the costs of doing business. Wolfson oversees 700 employees, including 160 attorneys. So far, nobody else has announced plans to run against him in next year's election. Well, he captivated Las Vegas with his up-tempo style of coaching, his run-ins with the NCAA, and of course, the towel biting. Right, and, and now former run rebel coach Jerry Tarkanian is getting the star treatment. He's being immortalized with a statue outside of the home of the Rebels. Chris Matthews is at Thomas & Mack now with a man who sculpted it. Chris. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, the bronze statue unveiled this afternoon, ironically, in between the Thomas and Mac, the house that Tark built, and of course the Mendenhall kind of ties those two eras together, the old school, the new school. Now you can see over my shoulder here, my right shoulder, there is the uh, statue of Jerry Tarkanian. Of course, he's got his championship ring on, this chair right next to him there. People will be sitting there taking pictures here. Joining me now is the uh, master sculptor. Here's Brian Hanlon. And Brian, just a terrific day here in Las Vegas. And all the work you did, and you mentioned this is one of the quickest turnarounds that you've ever done a sculpture. Uh, Chris, uh, this is a labor of love. Uh, very important to have historical markers that inspire and educate. This will absolutely do both for this community as Coach Tarkanian did 
to all the fans here and all the players. I thought it was interesting that you said you've never turned a, st a sculpture around that quickly as the one you did here. Yeah, we worked uh, a few overtime nights, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we knew what it was for, and I think, you know, you see his current health and there's a sense of urgency. This dedication would not be the same without the voice of Tark here today, and he was here. This was wonderful. What a great day. Great day. And how cool was it for you guys to put this in? You got the, you got the towel, you got the championship, <laughs> you got the chair. <laughs> yes, the, uh, in the meetings making the composition for the piece, we were trying to decide is the towel in his mouth or out, and Lois and I were leaning toward him holding it, but everyone else in the committee said, you have to put it in his mouth. This is, this is iconic. This is an iconic image for Re running Rebels basketball. So here it is. It, it looks great. It really does. All right, here it is indeed. A giant statue of Jerry Tarkanian forever immortali immortalized here between the Mendenhall and the Thomas and Mac. Reporting from outside the uh, Thomas and Mac Center. We'll have much more for you at 5 o'clock and later tonight at 11. Reporting live, Chris Matthews, 8 Sports Now. That's great, Chris. And with that empty chair, that is going to be a, a photo oh, yeah. uh, opportunity for a lot of people. Everybody's going to stop there, yeah? <laughs> yeah. All right, trick or treat. Fun for the kids, right? But definitely, definitely keep all the chocolate and candy away from the pets. We're looking at a dog whose stomach is distended. Do not let it turn into an emergency trip to the vet. We're going to tell you the four biggest risks for your pets this Halloween. You're watching 8 News Now at 4 with Denise Valdez and Paul Johnson. The news of Southern Nevada is now. Boy, do we like Halloween. Americans expected to spend $330 million on costumes for their pets. They sure are cute, but they can also need to be sure that they are safe for your pets. So in today's pet project, a local veterinarian says the wrong costume is just one of the risks that pets face. All right, mister. Dr. Debbie White has no problem putting her dog in this snappy little suit. It fits well, but not too tight, and he can see. What not to wear? We wouldn't want to use any rubber bands to secure any part of a costume on a dog, because that can cut off blood flow. Um, you don't want to block their vision, um, and certainly no dangling parts that are going to invite them to chew or to ingest their costumes. Eating the wrong thing is easy to do, like these cobwebs. Cats can play with it and start swallowing the stuff. But candy is the biggest culprit. Large quantities of chocolate can be really toxic. And keep an eye on the wrappers, too. For about a 25-pound dog, a small kiss or even a small candy bar isn't going to be a problem. It's really if they ate more like five chocolate bars that we could run into a toxicity. Watch out for this ingredient, xylitol. It's often found in sugar-free gum. Too much can make an animal sick, seizure, and even die. Don't put your pet into a situation they're uncomfortable in. If your pet is nervous or tends to be a bit nippy with newcomers, you want to keep them in a quiet back room and really not have them by the front door. And make sure they're wearing their collar and ID tag. The last thing you need is your pet darting out the door in the dark. All right, so keep an eye on the chocolate, the sweets, and put your pets in that quiet room away from all the action. You don't want Toby darting out there, and then you never see him again. Right. I remember coming home from a Christmas dinner and finding the dogs had gotten into all the chocolate <gasps> kisses. Remember? No way. <laughs> I found the wrappers all over. Eat. Didn't realize that chocolate was potentially dead. Very, yeah. Thank goodness they survived. Very good. Small doses. Yeah. Uh, if even that. All right, uh, celebrating 150 years. After the break, a look at how the governor and some local kids rang in Nevada Day a little early. Plus, a live look from Chopper 8 right now. Ken Smith has the trouble spots to avoid on your afternoon commute home. We'll tell you where it's at right after this. This portion of 8 News Now is brought to you by Richard Harris Law Firm. Our state is celebrating 150 years, and the governor and lieutenant governor were in the valley today to help some local students ring in Nevada Day just a little bit early. Governor Brian Sandoval and Lieutenant Governor Brian Krolicki spent the morning at Arturo Cambiero Elementary School discussing Nevada history with some fourth graders. The students are learning everything there is to know about the state. It's a way to celebrate. We have a whole year to, uh, to launch this and to embrace it. And these kids were just marvelous today. The energy, the positiveness. You know, Nevada Day is on equal footing as, as Halloween. Good energy, kids. Good positiveness. The students have been working on <laughs> projects like the models of the Lost City. The governor also stopped by the Las Vegas Mormon State Park this afternoon to unveil a refurbished old Spanish trail marker. 
I don't know, Nevada Day, Halloween might be a little bit more of a favorite. Yeah, I yeah, think so. Yeah, I think like right. those costumes. All right, let's uh, get a check on traffic this afternoon. US 95 and MLK is where Ken Smith is flying above in Chopper 8. Hi, Ken. And hi, uh, Denise, and hi, Paul. Good afternoon. I don't know if you ever noticed, uh, but Brian Sandoval, our governor, he is one of the best dressed people I have ever seen. He definitely knows how to wear those suits. Right now, we're taking a look here along US 95. Traffic right now definitely going downhill here. Right at MLK, you can see some heavy delays here. Also, I wanted to mention the southbound MLK K is backed up for about a half mile approaching Washington Street. Even the transition ramps here in the uh, Spaghetti Bowl area, very, very tough this afternoon. This is that snaky ramp that goes from northbound I-15 to MLK, very heavy there. And also you can see the transition ramp here from northbound I-15 to southbound US-95, extremely heavy delays. This whole area definitely in a gridlock situation. Delays right now on 95 heading southbound start way back around the area of Decatur, continuing solid all the way into Spaghetti Bowl. I'm not sure exactly what's going on, but this is very unusual for this time of the afternoon along US 95. Quickly, I want to show you at least some good news here along the 215 freeway, the 215 of Warren Springs. No delays right now. That is wide open with four travel lanes now in each direction between I-15 heading towards Windmill Lane. Reporting live here over a rotten spaghetti bowl area, I'm Ken Smith, 8 News Now. Ken, thank you. Local children who are still waiting for their forever home. This week's Wednesday's Child introduces you to a very exciting sibling set of six. Well, you might have seen this on our Facebook page today because this video is going viral. This is a 10-month-old little girl brought to tears by her mom singing My Heart Can't Tell You No, the sector by Rod Stewart. Mom says she's a little too shy to sing in public, but it looks like she's got a lot of fans now. Her daughter, like, you know, pulling a De Niro here with that, like, emoting with mom singing. That it's is crazy. Heartwarming, absolutely heartwarming. But when I sing, the dog howls. Yeah, that's not the kind of singing they're looking for. That's a a similar reaction, you know, Darren. <laughs> it happens. Quite the opposite of the one we just saw, yeah, the little exactly. kid there, yes. All right, so uh, absolutely beautiful outside and nice timing because uh, we're getting ready for Halloween tomorrow. A lot of people are going to be out trick-or-treating and we've been kind of cool the past couple of days. It's now the third day in a row with highs in the 60s. Now high pressure begins to build back in and we'll warm up just in time for the weekend and for Halloween as well. So I'll step out of the way. Uh, there's a beautiful live look outside. So we're in the 60s again. Normal high should be in the mid 70s. Uh, we're at 62 out at the airport. The winds are not a problem anymore. Henderson, a little bit warmer. You're currently at 65 degrees. We'll take you outside the valley all the way out towards the east there. Lots of uh, mid to upper and lower 60s currently. Water Street, 65. South Durango, you're at 63. Uh, cooler towards the north. Tonopah, 42. Laughlin, you're at 71. Uh, Boulder City, you're at 63. You see all the numbers out there. And again, the normal high this time of year should be right around 74 degrees. So we're going to get there as we head towards the weekend. Satellite radar shows that that airflow pressure that produced the showers a couple days ago and the mountain snow is now pushing off towards the east. It's centered right here. So there's the activity. If you're heading over farther over towards the east coast along a cold front here, you got some wet weather up towards Chicago, all the way down towards Dallas and through the southern plains. That'll continue over the next a couple days. Take a look at this. Freeze warning in effect for late tonight and through early tomorrow morning for Indian Springs, uh, Prump and Amargosa Valley. So you have those plants, you want to cover them up because by tomorrow morning, you're going to have overnight lows down near the freezing mark between 30 and 32 degrees. So again, freeze warning in effect for uh, early tomorrow morning. So there's the low that produced all the cool weather. It's getting out of here. Now high pressure begins to build back in and we start to warm back up. So tomorrow, forecasting a high of 70 and even nicer as we head uh, towards the weekend. All right, so here's a go. your forecast for tomorrow for trick-or-treaters. Absolutely beautiful, clear skies, 66 at 6. 63 at 7, 61 at 8, not too bad. And by 9 o'clock, temperatures come dropping down into the upper 50s. So we'll go down to 45 tonight here, chilly again. Tomorrow, here we go for Halloween, not too bad. Forecasting a high of 70 with plenty of sunshine. That's still cooler than normal. And then the 70 forecast shows for by Friday up to 75. First day of November, 77 on Saturday and through Sunday. Remember on Sunday at 2 a.m., 
We turn back the clocks an hour, we gain an hour of sleep, and then here comes another cold front Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, a lot cooler, 67 on Monday, even cooler on Tuesday and Wednesday. But for Halloween tomorrow, the forecast looks very, very nice. Back to you guys for right now. Yeah. Kids will be glad to hear it, Darren. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Well, on this Halloween Eve, we thought it would be the perfect time to take Wednesday's child to the pumpkin patch. Why not? Dave Gavassier is here now with a very special family. You, you got to take the kids to of bright course. orange fulfillment. You know, <laughs> you got to do that. Hang on to your hats because we have a sibling group of five to show you. And because they're all so active, we had to play close attention to put names with the faces. Hey. Before these kids scattered to the four winds, we got this group picture of them all, and then we headed off to the petting zoo. Okay, everybody got food? First, you should know that these kids are bonded and love each other and need to stay together. Yes, they're very bonded, very close to each other. Um, of course, like any sibling group, they fight constantly <laughs> over everything, um, a lot of arguing, but they're very bonded to each other. They've had each other their whole lives, and I think they need to stay together. That's Vicki, the foster mother, who says the oldest, Linasia, at age eight, tries to be a mother to the younger ones. She's probably the mother hen of everybody. Oh, she tries she. really hard to uh, keep her sisters and brothers in line, <laughs> help me out. She's a big helper. She, hel stuff. she loves to help with everything. Next in age are boys Camille, the most giving, and Kajan, the athlete. Kajan is six, and he's, he's our little football player. <laughs> he's, our, he's our Will Barrel, I'd say. Okay. He's, all, he's all boy, 100% yeah, okay. boy. He's right. um, totally into sports and whatever you can throw at him. Two girls round out this sibling set, Marcella, who's four, and little sister Armani at age two. Marcella's four, and she's in preschool. And she's a very loving, outgoing, courageous, fearless <laughs> pistol. She keeps you on your toes. These youngsters would be a blessing to any home. They're appreciative. Um, they're smiling all the time. You know, they, they try so hard to please. They're eager to please. Um, and they've had to overcome a lot, a lot in their li in their short little lives to get where they are. And they're pretty basically an easy little group for six to keep keep happy. I mean, you know, they're easy to please. They're they're they they're eager to please you. You know, they just they just want a mom and dad. That's all they want. Now you heard the foster mother mention six. There is another sibling, but she is going to live with her natural father. And whomever adopts the other kids would want to make sure they get to see each other once in a while. So call the local office of the Adoption Exchange if you're interested in this sibling set. The number is 436-6335. You can tell she really loves those kids. She, yeah, she's attached to them, but she knows that she can't adopt them, so that's why they're on Wednesday's trial. Right. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Dave. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back. This portion of 8 News Now is brought to you by Richard Harris Law Firm. An alleged game ends with a woman being shot in the head. Tonight at 5, why the lawyers of Colin Lowry say he won't be found guilty of murder. Plus, trouble catching up. The shortfalls in CCSD for older students who don't speak English and what's being done to help them graduate on time. Remember that smoky haze that filled the sky over Mount Charleston and much of the valley this summer as fire crews battled one of the most destructive wildfires in southern Nevada has ever seen. Crews fought back, dousing the Carpenter One fire without a single life lost. And for that, the Red Cross is honoring all 2,000 firefighters who battled that blaze as everyday heroes. panicking on the way down the mountain looking back up because you couldn't see anything. It was just entirely engulfed in smoke. A race to evacuate for more than 500 residents after a July 1st lightning storm set Mount Charleston ablaze. 28,000 acres scorched, a fire so large it took crews nearly two weeks to contain. It's us against the fire. Instant Commander Rich Harvey says it's a grueling job. Time away from home. Time without showers, time in the dirt, heat, bugs, snakes, bees. Crews camped out on the mountain for 16-hour shifts, beating back the flames, which in many cases stopped just short from homes. They saved all but one. When you're sitting around with a bunch of dirty, grubby firefighters that haven't had a shower in a week or 10 days, 
and, and they're grinning, and you can see the teeth through the black, grinning because they did what they like to do. Harvey knows that fires set their own rules. One even interrupted our interview. Okay. Wearing these suits takes courage. Harvey is accepting the Red Cross's Everyday Hero Award on behalf of all 2,000 firemen and women who braved Carpenter One. Some who came home with bumps and bruises, but also with pride for a job well done. When they are recognized for the job they did, especially by an agency like the Red Cross that has our respect, it means a lot. Thank you. And thank you. Harvey points out that most firefighters don't consider themselves heroes. They do it because they love the job. And they did a great job on Boy, that did fire. they ever, man. It seemed like that thing would never go away. I'll we'll see. Hey, thanks for watching us live at 4 o'clock today. Don't forget, we're always on at 8newsnow.com, Facebook, and Twitter. Have a great night. Hopefully, we'll see you at 5.